Good afternoon and welcome to the Rotary Club of Madison. I'm George Hidalgo, club president, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, I always start every meeting with bringing up certain aspect of our philanthropy. We're an outstanding club, and it's always great to remind ourselves about how phenomenal an organization we are. So I'm going to focus today on our scholarship program. Now, we hold our annual scholarship uh, luncheon in May, and many of our members say it's one of the highlights of the Rotary year uh, to meet so many well-deserving students who need financial support to attend college. Now, what you may not know is that there's a heck of a lot of planning that goes into a careful selection of the scholars. It actually starts this month. So if you think about it, May is when we present the award. Well, why are we starting all the way in September? Well, bottom line, our scholarship committee begins communications with participating high school counselors. There's a great deal of coordination and planning with our seven-member scholarship committee, which spends hundreds of hours with the schools and the students as they look to select the students that best meet our criteria. Obviously, we're not going to give it to anyone. It has to be a deserving student that's going to be successful. Our, our foundation is distributing four-year scholarships assistance to over 100 students per year, which is a total of $320,000 that we distribute every year, every year. So again, that's $320,000 that distributed each year. Let me say that for the third time because I want everybody to understand exactly how much we contribute to our community. $320,000 that is distributed each year. And not only do we distribute that, but we also uh, have uh, mentors that volunteer, a uh, rotary mentor who stays connected with them during the college year. So not only is it the money, right, which is tangible, but the intangible is providing a rotary mentor, which is really outstanding. So it's a good time for mentors to check in with their scholars now since it is an unusual start to the academic year. Uh, so things are crazy in this time of COVID. So it's important that the mentors contact their scholars. Let them know that you're thinking about them and that you are available as needed. It will mean a lot. Without a doubt, it means a lot. So our scholarship committee and our scholar mentors are committed to continue to serve our community and connect to our scholars as they grow to become our future leaders. Again, highlighting a great example of philanthropy in our club and basically every single Rotarian makes this phenomenal scholarship program available to our community. So you should feel proud of the contribution. So thank you very much. Our opening music, let's direct our attention to Casey Oakers, who will play the national anthem for us today. Thanks, Casey, for that opening song. I also want to thank all of our musical members for joining in for the On Wisconsin song last week. If you didn't see it, be sure to go to YouTube and watch last week's recorded meeting. You'll see Bob Dendorf, Heidi Frankson, Pat Gutenberg, Brad Hutter, Dick Lovell and his wife Cindy, Casey Olkers, Jenny Serino, 
and who joined with Jeff and Angela for On Wisconsin. It definitely needs to have fun fact that I'd like to have during our meetings. So thank you very much. On to new members. I'm pleased to introduce a new member who is here with us in person. So this is a very special treat. Jessalyn Holler has been loaned the classification of consulting and is president of Edology Consulting, LLC, an education consulting company. She is sponsored by Ryan Luskin. Born in Rutland, Vermont, Jessalyn came to Madison in 2016 from Washington State. Uh, Jessalyn and her husband, Jim, live in Orchard Drive in Madison with their two daughters. Now, she holds a bachelor's degree, summa cum laude, in English and International Affairs from Lafayette College. So I guess I better watch what I say here. Um, a master's degree in education from Edgewood College and a doctorate degree in curriculum and instruction with a focus on social foundations and teacher education policy from the University of Washington, where she also received the Gordon C. Lee Dissertation Award. I also want to mention that Jesslyn was one of our lead speakers early this spring during the first month of our virtual meetings. It seems like a long time ago that we've been in, in uh, these virtual meetings, and definitely uh, those parents that uh, have to do homeschooling, uh, hopefully you picked up some good tips from uh, Jesslyn's uh, presentation. Uh, so she spoke about engaging kids in learning amidst school closures during the pandemic. So if you didn't see it, go to our club's YouTube channel and watch it. Uh, Jesslyn is a member and past president of the Wisconsin Association for Colleges of Teacher Education. She is also a member of the American Educational Research Association and the American Educational Studies Association. She enjoys spending time with her family, reading, hiking, by the way, we do have a hiking club, so, and walking outdoors, tennis, and playing the piano. So as you can see, uh, we have a very active music committee. So let's give a warm welcome to Jess as she joins our Rotary Club today. It's a pleasure to be joining your club. I'm excited to be here and to serve, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, the things we have to do for social distancing, but thank you very much. Great to see you in person. So on to committee reports. Um, We'll go into the Ask George, George section, which is something that I started. And as you know, I get asked a lot of questions by members. So once a month, I'm featuring one of the questions. And I'm enlisting helpers. I mean, we have uh, a talented group, 450 members. So we have people that are much more talented than I that can probably provide really outstanding answers. Um, so they're, you know, they're, they're uh, helping us out and providing good, really good responses. So here's this month's question. Hey, George. What's the deal with the recent dues increase? Why are dues now $780 per year for standard members? Well, that's a good question. And so we've asked past president Ellsworth Brown to help respond. So let's hear Brownie's answer. I'm glad you asked about it, George. But to begin, a personal note, I'm very proud to be speaking to you from my new home recording studio, which I set up just for this occasion. I've noticed that many people place themselves in front of books uh, to show that they have some. Fortunately, I've discovered a young company that specializes in temp pandemic services, and uh, I was able to rent these bookshelves behind me and the books, in fact, the titles of my choice for them at a very reasonable price. One of the very clever cost measures uh, for saving and keeping the price down, on the other hand, was... Uh, let me see if I can show you a book here. This one has a very impressive title. Um, I don't know if you can see it in the light. It's the History of America from 101 Objects by the Smithsonian Institution. And it's also impressively heavy. You'd be amazed how many people are impressed by the weight of a book. But the secret to the price uh, savings of the company, and thus the rental, is this. Nothing inside, just the covers. On the other hand, uh, I have long since learned that, uh, as a matter of fact, possessing a book for a certain period of time is the same as having read it. In fact, because of this feature, I've been able to read all of these books yesterday. Now, on to the subject at hand, as past president of our club, and of course thus living in obscurity, I've been involved in the past uh, with the Flood Budget and Finance Committee and developing the annual budget operating report. The current committee has talked about the issues of required payment for uneaten meals. 
that has actually subsidized the club's operating budget for a number of years. And that's because historically, on average, 46% of prepaid meals are not actually consumed by members. Now, I'm, uh, I'm committed to transparency. You can trust me. Uh, others will use this statistic at face value, but to be perfectly honest, there are several things you should know about the number. Uh, a small portion of this statistic is accounted for by picky eaters who only come for the cookies. And about those cookies, I have seen people circle the tables when leaving, putting cookies in their purses and pockets, which is a drain on our operating budget under the old system. And we have received unsigned letters, in fact, asking it to be no more lemon bars or fudge squares, which don't hold well in pocket or purse. And speaking of purses, occasionally, people with large purses, Melanie, have hung them on an adjacent empty chair to save space and then asked for a meal to be placed there for the expected person only to slip the food, plate and all, into the large purse in the crowd's confusion after the closing bell. So when you think about it, each time we came to lunch, we were removing a portion of the club's operating income. Uh, we ate into the money they could have used otherwise for, well, bad pun, I'm sorry, uh, for uh, operating expenses. And further analysis, in my opinion, might find that it was the sheer collective concern for the health of the operating budget that kept nearly half of our members away from lunch on any given day. Think about it. On occasion, uh, the committee actually has discussed the changing of that structure, so dues cover operating budget, but it never moved forward until the pandemic forced the issue. As you know, an ad hoc committee did review the budget uh, and dues and meal structure and made actionable recommendations so that the new dues structure recommended by the committee and able to be adopted by the board is more equitable for members because it reflects the true costs of the club and spreads them more equitably among the different types of members. So what does the operating budget include? Membership dues, admission fees from new members, which by the way have been reduced to $100 through June 30th, and Madison Rotary Club Foundation covers 20% of the administrative costs through its investment earnings because our staff works on foundation activities 27% of the time. One result of this is that each time we came to lunch under the past structure, we were taking income away from the club. Our main operating expenses are $120 per member for our club's district and Rotary International dues, of course, staff, office rent and supplies, hotel meeting room rental space when we are meeting in person, and lunch costs for speakers and their guests and hosting potential new members. This year's budget includes reductions as well in the following. We won't include a meal at any in-person director meetings. We won't send our incoming president to the Rotary International Convention. No new office computer will be purchased, though it was scheduled for replacement this year. And there are no staff salary increases, as well as no year-end event costs. All members received a letter outlining the new structures uh, for the future. And when we return to in-person meetings, a standard member who buys the minimum of 12 meal tickets, 50% of the meetings would pay $23 less per year. The new rate would be $1,212 per year as compared to the past 50% meals, $1,235 uh, with the previous structure. So if a standard member buys more meal tickets than the minimum of 12, of course, the annual cost would go up. But not all of the expense, none of it, in fact, would come out of the operating budget. The board acted under emergency authority to approve the changes in our due structure. Once the pandemic emergency has subsided uh, to the point where a membership vote is actually possible, the revised due structure will be put into effect uh, to put into a vote for the members. Our club leadership believes these changes to our due structure are necessary and appropriate to assure the financial viability of the club. So now, meal tickets cover the cost of food and dues cover the cost of the club operations. It's fair and it's good business. And if you have any questions, however, or concerns about the new plan, feel free to contact the Rotary office or any other club board member or President George. But just don't bring up cookie theft with George. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ellsworth, for that answer. And let me go on to the next announcement, which is Carol Kobe is a member of this year's Swarzynski Humanitarian Service Award Committee, and she has an announcement. Carol? 
Thank you so much, uh, President George. And this is an amazing studio and a real pleasure to be here in person with fellow Rotarians and to deliver this message to you. Uh, the Rabbi Manfred Swordzinski Humanitarian Service Award was established by Rotary in 1982 following the death of the rabbi and is given by our club each year to recognize our former Rotary member for his remarkable life and to honor his legacy and commitment to social justice, civil rights, religious tolerance, interfaith dialogue, and reconciliation. Last week, we were treated to the award-winning video of the rabbi's life that was produced by club member Dick Goldberg. And if you haven't seen it or would like to refresh your knowledge of this amazing story, a link to the video is available on our Rotary's What You Need to Know email on Friday. And it's also available on YouTube. And this video is especially valuable for new members to see and will help you understand why this award is considered our club's most prestigious recognition of an individual. As an add of incentive to watch the video and to support President George's edition of Fun to our Rotary 4-Way Test, we are offering an opportunity for you to win a prize. And it's this fused glass votive vase, which was made by our fellow member, Denny Carey, who coincidentally happens to be my husband. But that's another story. So, uh, But uh, the winner of this vase, his name will, will be drawn from the members who successfully answer the weekly quiz question about the rabbi, which will be in Friday's newsletter. And the answer to the quiz can only be found on the video. So watch the video, answer the question properly, and your name will go in a hat, and you may win this vase. But the most important thing that you can do is to take this time to thoughtfully nominate a person who merits this award. This is an individual who fulfills two criteria. One, someone who has, through voluntary efforts, made a particularly outstanding contribution to humanitarian service in the greater Madison community and beyond. And two, who has helped build bridges and sought reconciliation between groups and individuals. Does this describe someone you know? Someone whose words, deeds, and actions better the lives of others and bring people together? If it does, now is the time to nominate that person. Nominations are due by October 1st. The Swarzynski Humanitarian Service Award Committee will then select the awardee who will be presented at a November Rotary meeting. And this year, everyone who has been nominated will also be recognized. The nomination form link is on the Rotary website and on what you need to know. The Rotary Office can always give you more details on how you can submit the strongest nomination possible. Rabbi Swarzynski once said, the power of love is stronger and more enduring than the forces of hate. This year, more than ever, this message needs to be reinforced. And one way we can help promote it is through our Swarzynski nominations. We know our community has many deserving people worthy of this award, and we want to see them recognized and honored. So you have your assignment. Turn in your nominations by October 1st. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carol. On to birthdays. So we have birthdays to celebrate with a bit of humor or wisdom that complements Rotary's mission. We also encourage members to make an age-appropriate gift to the Madison Rotary Foundation, rounded up to $100 for our Club Synergy Scholarship Fund. So September 7th, Mark Green. September 7th, Jennifer Winding. September 9th, Michelle Drea. Also September 9th, Melinda Heinrichs. Also September 9th, Mike Wilson. September 11th, Emily Greenwell, who shares a quote from Audrey Hepburn. As you grow older, you will discover that you have two hands, one for helping yourself the other for helping others. Great quote. In addition, we have a message from Teresa Holmes, who shared on her birthday uh, on September 2nd. Uh, today is, her quote is, Today is a good day to live joyously, as we connect virtually to celebrate it. 
Let's dream fearlessly, serve one another, one another humbly, and build bridges for a better tomorrow. Great inspirational quote, Teresa. Also celebrating birthdays this week are Jane Coster and Sharon Mimets, Mimets from our Rotary Office staff. So happy birthday to Jane and Sharon as well. Thanks to our celebrants for their contribution to the Madison Rotary Foundation. Casey Oakridge will play happy birthday on her flute for this week's birthday. Headlines and announcements. As District Governor Bill Pritchard announced last week, Brian Baskin was our club's winner for the District's Yes Award. Now, Bill sent me the gift for Brian. I'm pleased to be presenting it in person today. So thanks, Brian, for keeping our Rotary members meeting virtually. So thank you very much. Outstanding job. So I appreciate everything that you do for our club. So now, looking at a featured member in the news. So my featured member in the news this week is Maji Sarmadi. Maji joined our Rotary Club in 1998. He has served as chair of our club's Cultural Awareness Fellowship Group, and he chairs last year's Swarzynski Award Selection Committee. In addition, he has been on our club board, served on a scholarship selection committee, and he is a scholar mentor. Maji is a professor for the UW Madison School of Human Ecology. Maji has co-authored or co-authored more than 75 scientific papers and holds three patents. And he says on his website bio, I don't make the fabrics. I make them better and safer for people and the environment. That is a good reference point for this his recent news item, Majid was pictured and quoted an article about his work in designing a COVID-19 face mask that is now being used by students and faculty on the UW-Madison campus this fall. This news article appeared in the UW-Madison News on August 26, and for his extensive efforts with the UW face mask project, Majid has been named to the university system's list of heroes. Congratulations, Majid, and thanks for your great service to our community. So looking at other members in the news, uh, Mike May, who is recently retired as City of Madison attorney, has joined the Boardman Clark Law Firm. And congratulations to Nita Mohammed, who has been named this year's Women of the Year by the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society in Madison. Now, as your district governor mentioned last week, we have some updated totals on our giving to the Rotary International Foundation for the 2019-2020 year. Now, club members raised $54,340 through June 30th. This is terrific news, as it means we exceeded that $100 per member requirement in order to be eligible for district and global grant money. So we sincerely thank Charles McClymans for leading us in a successful campaign, especially during the pandemic. Thank you, Charles. Outstanding work. So on to our program. Today's speaker is Major General Marshall Anderson, who retired in 2016 from a distinguished career in the U.S. Army Reserve after 36 years, including serving as the Deputy Commanding General of the Army's Human Resource Command at Fort Knox, Kentucky, from 2010 to 2011. In 2011, she became the first African-American woman to achieve the rank of Major General in the history of the United States Army. Her service culminated with her assignment at the Pentagon as the Deputy, Deputy Chief of Army Reserve. So as most of you know, I was a lowly captain, and for those that don't know rank, after captain you have major, then you have lieutenant colonel, then you have a colonel, then you have a brigadier general, then you have a major general. So I am humble and feel like a peon in the presence of Major General uh, Anderson here. So she's here to speak to us about her experiences over a 36-year military career. 
focusing on how she successfully navigated a large organization that has a culture that requires strategic, results-oriented leaders who can work with a wide variety of people and adapt quickly to changing requirements. We look forward to your presentation, Major General Anderson, and we have made a contribution to the Rotary International Polio Plus Fund as a way to say thanks for speaking to us today. Now, if you have a question for her, please use the chat feature during our meeting. I'll be watching the chat and will select questions to ask her as time permits after her presentation. And in her presence as a lowly captain, I'm unbelievably nervous, so please not too many tough questions. Uh, so let's welcome Major General uh, Anderson to our virtual podium. Thank you, George. Um, I'm most impressed by uh, your uh, ability to do push-ups at your age. <laughs> but thank you, everyone. And um, I've been looking forward to this presentation. And I'm going to do my best to leave some time for questions, because I'm sure there will be some, uh, particularly when I get to the second part of my presentation and talk about uh, the military decision-making process and how we manage crises. Um, that's a subject that I've spent a lot of time in my military career studying. So trying to get it in in 20 minutes is a Herculean effort, so I'm sure there's going to be lots of questions. So let's get started. Um, life's definitely a journey. Um, I threw this picture up of, of myself in sixth grade because I know we all have pictures like this hidden somewhere in our homes. Um, but that's just to demonstrate to you that this little girl on the left, um, people that uh, were in school with me, the nuns who taught me in, in grade school, would never have told you that I was going to end up being a leader. And um, I just think that's a a good example of what can happen to you in life if you have the right mentors and, and good opportunities. Um, so how did I do it? I know that's a burning question that people would like answered today. So I'm going to spend a little time talking about that and um, try to give you some examples of things that I did for those of you who are early in your career or at the middle of your career. Um, you know, obviously I was in largely male organizations. Um, I have a, a, a legal degree. I worked as an attorney for a number of years as Deputy General Counsel at, at one organization and for the United States Courts. And then, of course, my other career in the Reserves was it also in a largely male organization that was still operating the way it had for many years. I started in 1979, so it was at the end of the 1970s and the beginning of the 1980s. Um, I had a lot of legacy colleagues in both organizations. Um, a lot of my colleagues in law school had dads um, who were lawyers. Um, I had nobody in my family who was a lawyer. Um, same thing in the military. Uh, a great percentage of the people who are currently serving in the military have family members who served in prior wars or in, in other conflicts. Um, I didn't have a road map that I could easily follow because there weren't a lot of people who looked like me um, or who were women. So I really didn't know who to talk to. My dad did serve in the Korean War, but he was an enlisted person. He was only in for four years. And his perspective was going to be very different than mine as an officer. Um, and then I didn't have the playbook. Um, I, I, I tell people this all the time. I think there's a magic playbook that I never got a chance to look at. So I kind of had to figure out things on my own. Um, and I did that in a variety of ways. At first, like a lot of young people, I thought, if I just do a good job, that's going to be good enough. And people will notice. Well, I quickly, quickly found out it wasn't always about doing a good job. Um, so then I began to get up in the ranks, and I realized I had to master what I call horrible meeting syndrome. Um, and that's really going into a meeting as a young person, whether you're a woman or a man, um, offering up an idea, people in the room kind of look at you, then they move on, and then suddenly some other person says what you said, but in a different way, and it's embraced, it's exciting, it's the greatest idea since sliced bread, and I said, this has got to stop happening. <laughs> um, because I think I want people to hear me. They need to hear me. So I began to think a little bit more um, tactically. I began to look at people's leadership styles, um, discarded what didn't work for me, and, and kept the things that worked for me. I also learned to think a lot more tactically about meetings, which I'll talk about a little bit later. I scaled up that approach when I got to the Pentagon because the stakes were a lot higher. Um, and so it's about planning the battle and winning the war. You have to think and act strategically in, in the legal profession as in, and in, in, the, in my military career. I had to approach things as I knew I wanted to win this war. Um, I wasn't always trying to be a general. That wasn't my goal. My goal was to do a good job. 
But in order to do that, I had to learn how to navigate this really foreign organization. So the things that worked for me. Um, identified common denominators, as I mentioned, for leaders in the organization who I viewed as successful. And things about their approach to their leadership, how they worked with people, how they worked the organization, things that were common across that, that spectrum. Um, I also made some strategic decisions. I decided early on I was going to volunteer for the challenging assignments. I would look at an assignment and say, do I have the skill sets that I think um, would help the organization if I took on this assignment? And I would do that more than once. And a lot of times there were things nobody else wanted to do. They weren't exciting. They weren't the high profile things, but they ultimately were the kinds of things that was going to help the organization move forward. So I did that more than once. And I also realized that the stakes were high. I had to consistently exceed. And for me, I couldn't just meet expectations. That was not going to be good enough. Uh, so I made sure that I studied. If I'd ask questions, I was the kind of person that asked everybody questions. I didn't care if you were a senior officer, you were a young private. If you looked like what you knew what you were doing, I was going to ask you how you did it, because I wanted to do it the same way. And I mentioned I began to prepare for meetings in a more tactical way. And then, as I said, I scaled this up when I got to the Pentagon. What I would do is, if there was something on the agenda that I cared about, or it was an issue that I kind of felt was going to get um, buried in groupthink, I would start to talk to people before the meeting. I would find out if somebody else had a similar approach to this, if they felt the same way. Um, and then I would kind of let them know I was going to support them if they were the person who I thought was going to end up speaking about it. And if I was going to talk about it, I would try to get them to be an ally. It was kind of like survivor, but not quite on survivor steroids. Um, I had allies when I needed them for certain issues. And I found that that made me more successful in meetings. Because then I was going to get the head nods around the room when I suggested something instead of everybody kind of sitting there staring at me. Um, and so once you get that kind of buy-in from people, people see that in the room, the rest of the room begins to come around to your way of thinking. So that's how I got to be really tactical about meetings. Um, and I also, to be honest, in the military, benefited from a culture where you cannot afford to be an average follower or an average leader. And I say that because when we work in the military, when we practice our craft, even when we're training, people can get hurt. People can get killed um, because we're working with heavy, expensive, dangerous equipment. We're participating with live ammunition in our training because you need to make it realistic because when the real thing happens, you can't just pretend. You've got to have, and I'll talk about this too later, muscle memory. You have to be able to respond and react in that moment the way you would in a real situation. So you can't afford to be average any time in the military. And so I would suggest to you, when you see somebody in the military and you say, thank you for your service, I would like you to think about that. These are not average people. Um, because as we know, it's less than one half of 1% of us who are actually serving or have served. And then the last thing is, I really worked hard at building trust, relationship with people at all levels. And I didn't just focus on the people above me. I think that's a tendency for people to think, I've got to, you know, as I just say, suck up to the people above me. That's not, I think, at least for me, what makes you a successful person or, or gets you the kind of respect that you need when the chips are down. I worked with people below me and my peers to make sure that they could trust me. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit, how I did that. Um, I listened to people all the time. As I said, I was a big person for, for asking questions. Um, but when I asked a younger person in my organization, a junior person, a private, a captain, for their opinion. I really wanted their opinion, and I didn't fake it. A good example I'll share with you is one point in my career I ended up, and I'll talk about integrity in this, in this response, my, this story. Um, I was an operations officer, which is kind of like chief operating officer for a unit. And I had a commander who I worked for. And it came back to me that he had falsified um, some information on one of his travel vouchers. Um, and I certified everybody's travel vouchers. And so I took this very seriously. I did a brief investigation of my own and discovered he had indeed lied about something. And so I went to our civilian administrator and my senior sergeant and said, I'm going to tell 
the colonel, the brigade commander, who was everybody's boss. And he says, oh, no, you don't want to do that. And I said, well, yes, I do. It's the right thing to do. And he said, well, you know what's going to happen. They're going to come after you. I said, I don't care. Um, this is the wrong thing to do. So I ultimately reported him, and he was relieved of command, which is a pretty big deal. It's like firing a CEO. So the CEO got fired, and there I am, now the acting CEO. Um, so then my soldiers came to me and said, ma'am, you know, we need to move our unit. Now, that's a big deal. That's like moving a company headquarters. It's a big deal. You've got to move everything, everything. Um, we need to move it 100 miles south to Fort Dix, New Jersey. I was in New Jersey at the time, and I said, okay, lay out, your clay, you know, lay out the case. They did. I said, okay, let's draft a plan. I tweaked it. I sent it up to our higher headquarters. Didn't hear anything. This happens a lot in the military and probably in corporations as well. You send it up, it gets lost in a black hole. It didn't get lost in a black hole. I went to a meeting with a lot of other commanders and the commanding general, after I got done doing my part of the briefing, each one of us had to brief on our organization, he turns to me and he says, oh, by the way, major, and I was still a major. I was in a lieutenant colonel position, but I was a major. He said, major, I just want you to know um, I've approved a plan to move your headquarters. Jaws dropped around the room. That just didn't happen. And I was ever stunned, and I knew he did it for effect. Um, but I said, you know, sir, thank you, but the people who really made this happen were my soldiers. And that's the way I did business all the time. I let people know I valued their input. I gave them credit. I didn't fake it because I really cared, and I cared about them. I communicated to them all the time. So I always thought it was better if people understood what they were doing. That made them more willing to do it. I supported my people. Um, I made sure they got their education. I made sure they got good assignments. I made sure they got opportunities to excel and succeed. Um, I didn't mimic other people's styles, as I've told you, and I always told the truth. Um, and I never, ever compromised my ethics. Even when, in that instance, I was so disappointed in a fellow officer, and I was concerned that they might come after me, but I thought, you know what, at the end of the day, I have to look at myself in the mirror and be proud and happy of who I am and what I've done. So just some general thoughts I have on, you know, success. I worked hard. Yes, everybody tells you that. Um, but I didn't take shortcuts. I tried to learn my craft. And, you know, it's when you're in the Reserve or National Guard, you're trying to balance two careers. You're trying to balance your professional life as well as your military career. And the demands and responsibilities in both are the same, even though, as people like to say, it's part-time in the Reserve and Guard. After you move up in the ranks, you're spending a lot of extra hours working at your craft. Um, I took care of the people around me, and I had fun. Um, I tried to have fun. I made sure my, my soldiers had fun. Um, and I encourage people not to take themselves too seriously because when you do that, you kind of become not nice to be around. Um, and then I would ask myself a lot if I was making sure people who deserve praise and recognition got it. And it can be something as simple as saying, you know, pointing out to the rest of the staff, you know what, I got a great letter from somebody about X and they've done a wonderful job in customer service and I want to recognize that. Small things like that mean a lot for people. Um, the other thing I learned, certainly in my legal career when I was practicing, is, you know, who's waiting for an answer? You don't want a client waiting for an answer from you. And I know a lot can get on your plate, but it's important to at least let them know you're working on it and that you're trying your best to answer their question. Um, I tried not to let the immediate drown out the important. You can get lost in the weeds and stuff. Um, and then I made sure I was trying to take proper care of myself. Um, you cannot neglect your own physical emotional um, and, and, and personal well-being. And also, family is important. You know, sometimes you have to say no to your boss or say, well, you know, I need to go to that birthday party or I need to be, I can't go on that trip because I need to do this for my family. And I did that a couple of times and it wasn't always received well, but it was important to that person in my family for me to be there. And I said, look, boss, I'll make up the time. I'll do what I have to to make this up, but this is important. And so don't neglect your family because at the end of the day, when your job is gone or you've moved on to something else, the one constant in your life is your family and friends. So let's talk a little bit about crisis management. Um, I Googled it, 801 million hits on Google. Um, but I got to tell you, I looked at a lot of those hits and um, they were, uh, I wouldn't say they were particularly useful. Um, and there were a lot of plans. There were large plans with appendices and lots of stuff. And I'm like, who's going to read this thing? Who's going to actually use it? 
I mean, there was a mental health crisis plan I found. I found a plan, of course, for hurricanes and earthquakes, um, social media crisis plans, um, you name it, lots of plans. Um, as I said, they were pretty lengthy. Um, and in some, in many cases, I thought, you know what, this would never survive scrutiny in the military, and it certainly wouldn't work in a, in a pinch. So let's just look at what we do in the military when it comes to crisis management. My little advancey thing's not working. Okay. There we go. Good. Okay. George Patton. A good plan violently executed now is better than a perfect plan ex executed next week. Um, they start telling you that when you're a lieutenant. Um, because if you're trying to <laughs> tweak it, make it pretty and perfect, by the time you're done, it's next week. And you are not ready for the crisis. You're not able to perform. So what do we do, really? We follow Colin Powell's advice. No battle plan survives contact with the enemy. So essentially that means you've got to have a flexible approach to planning. You've got to be willing to have a plan that you can adapt on the fly. And your people have to understand that that's your intent. Um, because they're going to be a huge part of this. And, and they're one reason why I think we're so successful in the military is we make sure everybody understands the plan. The lowliest private up to the general has to understand what the plan is and their role in it, or we're not going to be successful. So how do we do it? Um, for those of you who may remember the Cuban Missile Crisis, I'm not saying I remember it. Um, I have read about it. Um, um, but the big thing we learned there was there was a reluctance amongst the Kennedy administration civilian leadership to include the military because they believed the military were going to be focused on something that would lead to war. Um, and we know now that, you know, that was a mistake. Um, you need to include the diplomatic, the political, a piece of the economic, depending on what it is, and the military when we're, we're talking about our national security. I mean, all the players need to be at the table because everybody brings something in terms of diversity of thought and ideas for it. So the military approach to planning is one of the things we make sure is all the stakeholders are involved. Um, for a business, and you know, I'm going to talk about this, you might want to think about occasionally having your customers involved in, in depending on what type of the crisis uh, management plan you're putting together because they're going to have a role to play, but they may even have ideas about things you could do to approach it. The military decision-making process is what we formally call it, or MDMP. Um, it's kind of, you know, burned into your brains when you start learning, you know, you're going through your military education. Um, and I just want to let everybody know the Pentagon is, Pentagon is not a bunch of grain silos. You have to have all the parts working together to execute our national security. And I'm, and I'm, I, I want to dispel that notion that some people have that it's a real monolith, there's not a lot, it's a, it's a really well-oiled machine, doesn't always look like it, but I can tell you from having worked there for three years, it really does work. Um, and then the last thing is to remember that great ideas come from all levels, and the strategic corporal is not something I, a, a phrase I coined myself, it was a former chief of staff of the Army, General Casey, and what he was referring to was during the Iraq War, we had a lot of checkpoints set up early on, and they were manned by corporals, privates, and they had to make split-second decisions when a vehicle was approaching a checkpoint whether or not to fire on that vehicle because it was a threat and it could have been a car bomb or to let it pass through. They had to make that judgment by looking at the people in the car, the way the car was riding, if it was riding low, did that mean it was filled with explosives or was it simply filled with vegetables going to the market? So we call them strategic corporals because the decisions they made at those checkpoints invariably ended up in the national news if they made the wrong decision. So everybody's got to be thinking. So things to do. I'm going to talk about planning considerations, training opportunities, practice, and execution. Um, you have to decide the realistic situations. You can't plan for everything. You cannot plan for the zombie apocalypse. But you can plan for things that will happen in your area. Um, so think about those scenarios and, and put together your plans based on those, the likely, the likely scenarios. Um, look at your training opportunities. In the military, believe it or not, people who are on active duty, not the Guard and Reserve, spend about half their careers in professional mili military education and training because they're preparing for the real thing. Well, obviously, in the civilian world, that's hard to do. 
So you have to carve out time. You have to be creative about how you carve out time for training. And it may not always be a formal um, uh, exercise. It may simply be to something that you do in the course of the workday. And then you've got to practice. You've got to practice. Whatever it is, lot, practice makes perfect. Practice gives you muscle memory. And then the day that is going to come when you're going to need to execute. So that's why it's important to, um, important to make your training as realistic as possible. Throw in kinks. Um, you, everybody say, oh, here's the plan. We're going to follow this. Well, then throw in something. Make things change. And test people to see how they react under stress. Some planning considerations. Um, Contingency planning, we have plans in the military for everything. We have multiple plans for cr Middle East crises, for a, a Korean War. Um, and those plans are constantly updated and reviewed as situations on the ground change because you have to be ready. Um, we consider planning a collaborative, collaborative process. So we, as I said, make sure we have all the stakeholders in the room who might have something that they can add to, this, to, the, uh, to the plan. Um, and then... Our crisis action planning has six distinct phases. Now, as I said, this could be a master class, and I could go on about this for five hours, but I'm going to keep this short um, and hopefully have more time for, for people to talk about their questions. So there's the situation development, which, as I mentioned, basically is develop your scenarios. What are you trying to prepare for? Develop a crisis assessment, the kinds of things that matter with regard to the, to the situation, um, the things that you really want to focus on. Um, course of action development, you never present a commander with less than three COAs. You don't give them just one. Um, you select one of the courses of action. You do some execution planning. Just get ready. And as I said, it's game time. You execute. No such thing as too much training. Training develops muscle memory. You can incorporate training into your daily activities. And again, this is all about a commitment to excellence. As I said, practice muscle memory. Think about all the people who need to understand the intent and who, what they're going to need to know to do their jobs. Results must be communicated. Don't just have an exercise and not share what happened. A plan on the, on the shelf is just a nice move, novel, so let's, just, let's make, it, make it real. Tabletop or short exercises will yield lessons learned. And then lastly, just do it. So I talked about that, publish the plan, empower your subordinates to resolve shortfalls, communicate any changes quickly to everybody. You gotta be transparent to your public and to your employees. And then finally, respond promptly to resource requests. You can sort out the dollars later. So I wanted to leave some time for questions. Um, so I'm ready. Uh, okay, well, the, the first thing I wanna uh, make sure is that you have an outstanding presentation and a lot of food for thought, and I was taking a lot of notes. So can we get a copy of that, uh, your presentation? Okay, great, and we can share it on, uh, on our website. Okay, outstanding. So the first question is from Darren Harris. He asks, uh, when you use the word craft to describe what you do, can you share what you mean by craft at the level of an officer slash administrator? Craft. Craft, yes. I mean, you have to view what you do as a profession. Um, it's not just a job. Uh, it needs to be something that you want to excel at, that you want to become, you know, you want to have a, the kind of subject matter expertise that makes you a professional at, your, at whatever your, your job is or your career or your, um, your profession. Okay. Next question from Martha Sullivan. She says, culturally, how would you recommend convincing organizations that think planning is a waste of time that it is not? What compelling arguments would you offer to that resistance? I would just take a look at the situation we're in currently. It's our pandemic. Um, I think a lot of businesses, and I'm not going to, I don't know any personally, but may not have had a plan for this. They may have had something notionally. Um, and so I think, you know, from a business perspective, people had to scramble in some cases to come up with a workable solution for their workforce, um, take a look at um, their, their processes. Um, if you'd done that ahead of time, you wouldn't be trying to create things on the fly. And certainly if you are uh, you beholden to your shareholders and your customers, you owe it to them to have plans in place to deal with, as I said, the obvious um, um, situations that might arise. Okay, thank you. Um, so this is from Beverly. Uh, what was one of the hardest times slash tasks in your military career? 
I think it was the one that I described um, when I had to report to the senior leadership in my organization that my direct superior had lied about um, something on a, on a, on a document, um, knowing that at that time, you know, they could have decided to turn on me and close ranks behind him and, you know, make me go away. Um, and not support what I was trying to do, which was to let the soldiers know that it's important to be ethical. And that was very difficult. I remember sitting in my commander, the, the, the colonel, he was a full colonel, I was sitting in his office crying when I told him this. Not because I was worried about myself, I was so disappointed that a fellow officer had violated his oath um, and had lied and lacked integrity that I was embarrassed, ashamed, and appalled. Okay. Um. This is from Cheryl Cato. What are some of your go-to stress management resources? Um, I run, walk now. I used to run. Now I just run and walk. Um, uh, but exercise. Exercise. Um, I meditate. I try to remember to meditate in the morning. And even if it's only five minutes and I use some kind of a guided tool because I'm not really good at focusing. Um, and then, you know, making sure I carve out um, quality time with my husband. Um, even if we're just watching a television show, um, we used to spend some time together. Um, but yeah, you've got to take care of yourself physically and mentally. Thank you. Next question, I'm Elaine Mishler. Uh, you mentioned that you did not have many mentors when you began your career. Has that changed for young people who might have your career aspirations today? Oh, it's, it's definitely changed. Um, I think I'd say about mid-career is when I suddenly realized people were mentoring me. Some of it I didn't understand at the time what was going on. Um, but I definitely think that has changed. There's definitely been a push, um, at least in the officer corps and the Army, to, to try to be more of a mentor to people and to try to, be, to mentor more diverse people. Um, so, yeah, I definitely think that has changed. Okay. This is from Ron Luskin. How can we instill more military discipline among the general public in fighting the coronavirus, more interest in understanding and sacrifice for the common good? You know, one of the things we, we know in the military, and I mentioned, it's, it, it's a dangerous business. You're, you can get hurt, injured, um, just in a training exercise. And so you learn to rely on your colleagues. You learn to recognize that the things you do to be safe is not just about you, it's about your colleagues. So when they give you instruction during a live fire exercise and tell you to keep your weapon turned off and pointed in a certain direction, you do that because you're, it's about keeping your colleagues safe. And then your colleagues know that they can trust you to do the right thing when you are in a real situation. Um, so it's, it's a culture in the military of taking care of each other. You've often heard about we never leave a person behind, and that is absolutely true. Um, I've heard numerous stories where people, you know, under fire were going to go back and get their buddy no matter what. It didn't matter if their buddy and them disagreed about something the day before. It's your buddy. It's a part of your organization, and you're duty-bound. Um, to, to make sure that you take care of them. So that's what I think we should think about, is this is about taking care of each other um, so we all get across the finish line. This question is related to, um, you had mentioned uh, about the fact that half of 1% of Americans are uh, serve their country, and it almost becomes like a disconnect in our political arena because um, commitments are made to deploy troops overseas without understanding the sacrifice and the lives that are at risk uh, because there's a disconnect between majority of American society and the military. Um, and that's ever since we went to the all-volunteer army. Um, and that's a huge challenge because I talk to recruiters and try and recruit when the economy is great is unbelievably difficult, even with retention bonuses of forty, fifty, sixty thousand uh, dollars. So, how do you see our military continuing uh, with an all volunteer army going forward? Is that even possible? I think it's possible, but I think the military itself, one, the military needs to do a better job of reaching out to um, different people. Um, we know that we're going to get people to volunteer from Texas and Florida and Georgia and North Carolina. We have a less success getting people from, believe it or not, Wisconsin, our very own state, um, and other states. Um, and so we have to talk about the fact that we need a diverse military. The one thing that makes us stand apart from other militaries, I think, is we've managed to be very creative and successful, but our luck's going to eventually run out. And if we don't emphasize that we need our military to represent our entire country, all demographics, all socioeconomic classes, 
um, we won't continue, to, I think, to be as successful as we have been. Um, so it's on the military, number one, to reach out to non-traditional lo locations and really step their game up. And two, we need to start talking to our youth about, okay, that's the military is part of our country. Don't you want it to look like the, the whole country and represent your ideas? And that's one reason why I stayed in. You will say, why did you stay in? And I said, I stayed in because I felt it was important for me to be at the table because I brought a different perspective and experience, and I thought that, would, that was valuable. And it turns out in many cases it was. So, you know, I felt justified in staying in. I'm glad I did. And um, I encourage young people to think about it. Okay. This last question here is um, the Military Selective Service Act uh, was found to be unconstitutional because it discriminates on the basis of gender. And that's uh, talking about transgender men, transgender women, and also uh, having uh, women uh, register for the elective service draft. So that's what the courts say, but I guess that's in Congress now. Do you think that uh, uh, what will happen with that act? Will the act be taken away? Will women be required to sign up for the draft? Or what, what do you see knowing the, the headcount issues that the military is currently undergoing? Well, I, and I'm only going to guess here, I, I would certainly guess that the military is communicating with Congress about their concerns about the future population, because right now, I think it's, and I may get this wrong, about one in eight, one in eight, no, three in ten, I'm sorry, three in ten young people are actually qualified physically and mentally to join the military. So we're competing for those three people at the same you know, other other businesses are competing for. So, um, you know, we have to open the aperture. We have to make sure it's wide enough and inclusive enough so we get the best and the brightest. So I'm hoping that that is being communicated to members in Congress. Um, we'll see. I wish I had a crystal ball to let you know what I thought was going to ultimately happen. But I, I do think we're going to recognize that we're going to have a manpower shortage and we have to address it. One of the things that just as an add-on question, because most people don't understand when you say only three out of ten are qualified. Can you explain what does that mean? Because you look at a high school class, and they should all be able to go in the military. What are the things that exclude them? Um, there's an aptitude test that people have to pass and take to join the military. Different different jobs require a different score on that aptitude test. Physically fit. We've got so many young people. I could probably outrun, and I'm an old lady of 62. Um, and they can't do a push-up to save their life, though George can. Um, but, um, you know, so there's physical and mental requirements. Um, and then, you know, it's just it's the ability to psychologically withstand the rigors of training and being deployed. And a lot of our young people, uh, unfortunately, are not able to um, um, withstand those kinds of stressors. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for your presentation, Major Anderson, and thanks for everyone who attended today's meeting. Let's give her a warm round of applause. I mean, a phenomenal job. Can we do that? I mean, a great presentation. Actually, there's a request from someone. You said you could talk five hours on uh, on the chat. Someone said, oh, could we get her for five hours? <laughs> so you've, you've got an interesting group because your presentation was, was uh, not only talked about military leadership, but really this leadership that can be used in the civilian world. And a lot of people don't understand that it is relatable and it's transferable also. So thank you very much. I'll say in presentation, we are adjourned.